Thank you guys for being such good sports. Um, my name is Janelle Riley, and I am so thrilled to welcome you to this Q&A with one of my favorite movies of the year, Concussion. Um, please join me in welcoming the star of the film. He is one of our greatest living actors, a two-time Academy Award nominee, a four-time Golden Globe nominee, and of course, a Screen Actors Guild Award nominee. Please welcome Will Smith. Thank you, thank you. So I guess I should just perform the end of the movie? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I was like, I was on my phone, I was like, where's my screenplay? Where's my screenplay? I don't, I don't know my lines, damn. <laughs> um, but it was, it was interesting because we were talking, we were talking backstage, uh, and, but you know, so it stopped, and as you can imagine, back there, uh, we were uh, uh, flabbergasted, uh, to say <laughs> that the least. Except, except yeah. Now, but you. And what I said, I said, well, no, it's like this, this uh, is a, a perfect moment. I said, I was reading something uh, about 14 months ago, and I made a real shift in how I look at my life and how I look at my work. And I said, um, that now when I get on an airplane, right? So you get on an airplane and you buy a ticket for a certain place. And I said, I started practicing releasing the expectation that I'm actually going to get where I'm going. The universe might have a whole other thing in store. I might be going to Miami, but this plane by, might be making an emergency landing in Dallas, and I'm going to have to spend the night in Dallas, and then I'm going to meet somebody and all. And I started, expectations are the mother of all disappointment, right? So it also goes to my acting. This a kiss of death to go to set expecting that the other actor's gonna do something, and when they do that, you're gonna say this thing, and your foot's gonna be forward, and you, <laughs> you know, and this one, and when they catch that one, is that, well, that's now, everything is gonna be spectacular, right? <laughs> right? So there's, there's a great river that is flowing, that's trying to flow through us as actors. And our expectations are always going to destroy the most natural thing that could come out of it. It's like, you got a stomach ache today. That's what it is. That's what it is. That's what you're using today. You, you know, you, you're, the other actor is not giving you what you had dreamed in your mind that you were going to get, right? So that can't stop you. You, you, have to, you have to adjust. You have to work with what you have. And it's not less. See, that was spit. Did you see that? See? <laughs> that was not, And it was lit. It was lit, too. So it was probably rough. <laughs> so, um, just, just use it to clean your shoes, baby. Just use it to. Um, <laughs> I didn't expect that, you know? Um, <laughs> But it's, it's really, it's really like that's, that is such a superpower in acting to let it go. Like don't, you can know your lines and all of that, but throw it away and be open to what can be new every time versus in your mind, you know how you want it to be. And I started performing like that. And it's been, it's literally like the last probably year and a half, just knowing my lines, but not going to set preconceived. And I'm flowing, what, where, you know, who knows what I'll say and how it'll go and just get comfortable in that ugly, sort of scary free fall that isn't what we planned in the mirror. You know, so it's been a really beautiful thing. It's been a really beautiful thing. And we're in that space now. And, uh, you know, just stay unfazed by the great river. Can I just say I'm so happy the film broke? I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly, right. No, that's so, I'm telling you, it's so real. I'm sorry, just in that, because I've been at, there was a, there was a, um, I, think, I think the book was called The, the uh, Ad Adversity Paradox, right? And, there's a, there's, this, there's a story that a guy tells, he was a, uh, he was a captain in, uh, in the Persian Gulf War, 
and he's leading his, his troops, and he's the, he was the navigator. And he's leaning there, and he has the map, and he works, and he walks, and then you know, he signals everybody to stop, and he kneels down, so all the troops are behind him. He's looking, and he stops for 30 minutes. And then finally, one of the guys comes up and says, hey, hey Cap, you all right? And he says, um, there was supposed to be a mountain right there. <laughs> and <laughs> the guy paused, and he said, uh, Cap, can I, can I give you some advice? He says, if the map disagrees with the ground, the map is wrong, <laughs> right? And the guy said, he said, he said, he knew it was profound, but he couldn't figure out why that was profound. And the reality is, it does not matter what you put on your fucking map. <laughs> you got to navigate the ground that's in front of you. You have to, you can plan your marriage was going to be this way and it was going to be great and my kids is going to do everything I said and everything was going to, and it's like, well, that's, that's not what you got. Like, <laughs> you have to navigate the ground that is before you and you have to get skilled at navigating the things that are not what you wanted, the things that are not what you expected, the things that are not how you dreamed them. And that's where the real skill is, is when you can even become an alchemist and turn that into something great. When you, you turn that lead into gold is the real skill. I'm sorry, okay, now I'm off of that. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just all right. Yeah. I'm not going to follow that. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be like following Dr. Bennett Omalu. I know, yeah. He somewhere. is so, he is such a beautiful man, uh, Dr. Bennett. I, w I wish he could, could, could have been here. He, he is such a beautiful, um, and, and you've met him. He's like, oh, I pushed brilliant. you out of the way to get Yeah, yeah, you actually yeah, knocked me down. I was like, hey, oh, yeah, you wanted to meet him. Out of the way, she wanted America's to meet sweetheart. Bennett. I can yeah. This <laughs> Okay, yeah, she does. I'll see her later. Um, <laughs> you know, but he, he's, uh, he's this wonderful combination. He's really brilliant. He's really brilliant. But he's so, um, it's like, it's not naive, but it's like uh, innocent. He, he literally could not understand why the NFL didn't want to know. He couldn't get, and still today, if you, when you talk to him, he kind of does, he understands that they didn't because of how it went down, but he cannot, <laughs> he cannot get his head around why, how, how is not knowing better than knowing, mm -hmm. you know? And it was such a, it was a, as an actor, it was such a beautiful thing to, to get my head around to be that smart and th that innocent at the same time. Do you think you would have played him if you hadn't met him? Because I know the script came to you yeah, first. Yeah, no, no, I would not. Um, I did not want to make a football is bad movie, you know. Sure, <laughs> listen. <laughs> Look, I'm saying I like getting invited to the Super Bowl. I like going. Um, uh, but I, I, I have certainly ruined my invitations for sure. Uh, uh, but you know, my son played uh, football. He played football for four years, and it was just the, some of the most beautiful bonding that we've ever had. It's like we really connected on this thing. And he was a wide receiver, and and you know, he was uh, so fearless. He would just run and jump and did not care to go catch that football any kind of any kind of way you know and I just I, I appreciated it I loved it we, we we really connected and you know I grew up in Philly a Philadelphia Eagles fan yeah in the building <laughs> it looked dope we just be we just do that when we we're from Philly we're from Philly we could do it for another 20 minutes but there's other stuff to, yeah yeah you know what I mean that's the joint Cheese uh, steaks. <laughs> um, uh, you know, but so so I did I didn't. But I digress. But I didn't want to. I didn't want to. Um, I just didn't want to be that guy. And uh, and I met with Dr. Omalu, and he uh, he said one of the lines that we use in in the movie is in our first meeting. He said when he was a little boy growing up in Nigeria, 
heaven was here and America was here. And to him, it was the place where God sent all of his favorite people. You know, and I was like, I, 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 you know, um, but it was like, he so deeply believes in American ideals. Like even now, even now, you know, he just, he, he, he has eight degrees and he said part of the inspiration of all of the education that, that he got is he thought that that's how that's what Americans respected, intelligence. And not, I was like, yeah. I was like, <laughs> I was like hey, listen, I don't know what CNN Nigeria is putting out, but <laughs> we got dumb people in the news here. Uh, no. <laughs> they must filter y'all stuff. Um, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, he... he um, for me, I, I am uh, I am deeply uh, and and profoundly American. Like uh, there's there's no country on earth that would allow me to exist and live the way I exist and live. America is the only country that would produce and support a, a Will Smith. You know, so I when when he hit me with that, I was like, yeah, you're right, you're right, yeah. Oh. You know, so it it was um, we we really connected, and with that, I I sort of connected on his connection between American ideals and his spirituality, because he's a, he's a another paradox is he's a scientist, but deeply religious. Mm -hmm. Like really seriously, like everything's a sign, you know, everything means something. And when he puts his hands on the body, he, he sort of sees himself as the threshold guardian between this world and the next, right? So he's really spiritual, but a man of science. And that's, it's, it, you know, it seems like that would be a conflict, but in him, it's just, there's no conflict at all. God is science to him. You know, so for me, that was a really that was a, an, an interesting thing to understand and and to 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 play. And I, you went spent some time with him, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially like, is this correct? Doing autopsies? Yeah, yeah. It was. It was. We went. Yeah, I went to see five autopsies, <laughs> and because he's he's so comfortable around dead bodies, I went and I saw I saw the first one, and I was like, I think I'm good. Like. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> No, as an artist, I think I got it. Um, <laughs> you know, but but he is uh, he is so he's so comfortable around dead dead bodies, right? So I figured I had to, you know I, I kept going and tr started to get comfort, com trying to get comfortable. But it, it it's the complete dismantling of a human body, it, like. You know, it's the 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 wide cut shoulder. Not me. No, no, just the, no, no. Oh God! No, but There's it's no shoulder down, <laughs> shoulder center, stomach, skin up over, and and then the you know cut the ribs and take the chest plate out. But that happens in like twelve seconds. Wow! Like that's that you're like, hey man. <laughs> Yo, it's, it's novices in here. You need to slow that down. <laughs> Just can't hand your, somebody chest to somebody in front of me. <laughs> you know, but he's playing reggae. You know, and it's like it's it's you know it's it's like he he's trying to make it a happy space for the transition of this soul to yeah. the next place, right? So. But I, th I think what, what happened with me is it became a spiritual experience because when you see a, a body taken completely apart in that way, what you realize is the thing that makes a person is not the body. Like, you, it gets really clear mm -hmm. because all of the stuff is still there. All of the stuff is right there except the thing that m makes them a person. 
right? You know, and it's such a beautiful revelation when you see it in in that way. You know, I think that that um, I think everybody should should see an autopsy. The two things everybody should do is see an autopsy and jump out of an airplane. <laughs> Yeah, I just as actors, I think that as uh, it's like you have to see an autopsy and you have to jump out of an airplane. All right, so I like two years ago, I jumped out of an airplane. Here's what jumping out of an airplane does. So first of all, you're gonna do it with your friends, so you set it up, right? So you make a date, and all your friends have agreed, and you don't you don't see no reason to jump out in no damn perfectly good airplane, <laughs> but you committed in front of your friends because I was drunk one night, and you said, yeah, you're gonna do it. So as the days near, right, it's pure terror, and you, your mind starts saying, well, no, you know, listen, they don't have families, you know, they all single, you know. <laughs> you know, they can do that, they can do that, you know, they, you know, they, can, be, they can be wild and crazy with their lives, but I got responsibilities, you know. <laughs> so you, and that inner voice starts talking to you, and you're trying to get anything to not jump out of that airplane. So as the days come nearer and nearer, and your friends who are going through the same thing, but you don't know that, like they seem like they want to jump, right? And then you get there, and the fear is, in, like it is grabbing you, and it's t telling you all kinds of stuff. You get into an argument with one of your friends, like all of that type of stuff. And then you get in the airplane, and you go up. Oh. And the fear is like, you keep, like, there's no reason, and that's the thing. You keep saying, this is dumb. There's no reason to do this. There's no reason for this, right? And then they open the door, right? Jesus. And at that moment, you realize you've never been in a damn airplane with the door open before. <laughs> right? Again, there's no reason to open the door in a perfectly good airplane. And then the green light comes on, and somebody goes, oh. right? And you're like, yo, hey, don't put your hands. There's no reason to put your hands on me. You don't have to put your hands on me, right? And the first time, you're strapped to a guy, right? And they walk you up to the door of the airplane. <laughs> and you're looking out of the door of an airplane. Right? And you're like, oh my God. Oh, this is this is all bad. This is all bad. Nothing good can come out of this. And they say, put your arms over you. So you put your arms over. What you don't know is because they don't want you to grab because people grab. Oh. Right? And they say, on three. And you say, go. And they go, one, two, and push you on two. No. <laughs> they push you on two because they know you're gonna grab if they wait till three, <laughs> right? And you're out of the door and you will never, ever, ever experience more fear than the first second falling out of an airplane. It's the maximum terror that your body can experience, <laughs> right? But in one second, it's gone and then you're flying and it's euphoria, you're like, Oh, it's the most beautiful experience. It's the high, and you see for miles, and it's your fall. You fall for like 45 seconds at 90 miles per hour, but the weight of it feels like it's holding you. You actually don't feel like you're falling. You feel like you're being held, and it's the most beautiful feeling. It's the maximum fear, and in a second, it's the most beautiful feeling, and you learn a lesson about fear. So all of the time up to that point when you were terrified, there was no danger. Mm -hmm. You were terrified in your bed the night before, <laughs> right? You were terrified in the car driving to the place. Like you were terrified flying in up and taking off. And then at the point of maximum danger, you're having the best time of your life, <laughs> right? And you learn that fear actually is, is not a real thing, right? Fear actually is it's trying to preserve your life, but you're, it's a waste of your time and your energy 
there's no danger. If you're scared, that means there's really no danger because you're projecting of how bad it could be. You're actually not in the danger. Once you're in the danger, your mind gets consumed by surviving. You're actually not fear, you're fearful, you're exhilarated. So I learned a really valuable lesson about not letting those moments, those four days before you start shooting, there's no reason to be terrified, right? You have to use that time to prepare. Like there's a much better use of the time and the energy than fretting about what could go wrong. It's like that's, that's a huge preparation time and not allowing that fear to consume you because it actually, it, it, it destroys the beauty of what you could be doing in that time rather than just sitting around making up what could go wrong. You're, you try to decide and find the worst stuff that could possibly happen, which 99% of the time the worst thing that could possibly happen doesn't. You know, so it was like autopsy, you jump out of an airplane. I want to sign up right now. <laughs> I'm sorry, forget the movie. I want to give you a SAG award for that performance. That was amazing. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Have you only been once or does this huh? regular thing now? What? Uh, you jump out of jump planes? Out of an, you know what? It, I've, I've done it four times. <laughs> And five autopsies, so I probably need to jump out of an airplane one more time. Um, it's a good New Year's thing to do, right? Because fear, fear is the greatest enemy to what we do, right? If you're scared, you cannot get on camera and let it rip. You can't let it rip if you're scared. Like, you really have to get comfortable dealing with fear. You know, because everybody, you're always going to have it. You just have to learn how to pass it through and get back to the space where you, you just, you don't give a fuck. Like, that's what it has to be. I don't care. I don't care whether I get this job or not. I don't care. What, what I care about is being free and authentically me no matter what. If I can do that, everything else is going to fall in line. Um, and I'm curious, speaking of fear, um, you've played real people before. Yeah, you have two yeah. Oscar nominations to prove it. Um, Thank you. <laughs> well, yes, I was nominated two times prior. I'm glad you brought that up. Um. Yes. Should I go on? Should, should have won last time because it still makes me cry to think about that movie. But, oh, but yeah. Um, but uh, when you're playing, so obviously when you're playing Muhammad Ali, there's yeah, a certain yeah. amount of imitation you have to do. Mm -hmm. Since people don't know, you know, Dr. Bennett Omalu off the top of their head, right. how important was it for you to get his physicality, to get his voice? Yeah. The um, generally, what I, I, I always start with um, with externals first. You know, I like the, you know, with, I've only ever played living people, so I, I work better from a model. If I, you know, if I can find someone in my life or something that the uh, where there's a, a there's a person that I'm working off. Like with, for Pursuit of Happiness, I tried Chris Gardner, um, but he, there there was there was nothing that I could really latch onto that was extreme. So I ended up using my father. Right, so you, so the the Chris Gardner character, I'm actually I'm doing my father, um, you know, and he had you know the, the, he he had the little hey hey Fred Fred, you know why don't you beat your little rug somewhere else man, you know it's like that that was my father that you know that that thing so I was really so I used his physicality and. Um, because do, doing what you know is huge. Like, mm -hmm. as much as it's, it's something that you know thoroughly that you're, you're comfortable with, it, it's the better. Um, and with, with Muhammad Ali and well, with all three of them, once I can land on the thing that they want most in life, that, you, that opens the character up to me. When, when I landed with Bennett, that everything in his life was around being accepted as an American. And I went to his house and, you know, he had the reason he bought that car is because he thought that that was the car that would make him be most accepted. And I, I found it in, in myself. I became a movie star because my girlfriend cheated on me when I was 15. And in my twisted psychology, I was like, if I'm the most famous person in the world, no woman could ever cheat on me. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? And it doesn't have to be sane. It doesn't have to be sane. You just have to believe it, right? And when I, when I clicked into that, when you find everybody has something they want more than everything else. And then once you click into that, you start to realize that thing that they want is why they do all the things they do the way they do them. And yes, people want two and three and five and seven things, but there's one thing that everybody wants more than everything. And that becomes a good solid 70% of their lives. And when you, can, when you can tap into that thing, for me, it opens up the character wildly. So what, what, do, what do they want? Why do they want it? What's going to happen if they don't get it? Those three questions have been very, very successful for me, finding the baseline of a character. The, talking about the girlfriend who cheated on you, I'm like, wait, that's the basis for Hitch. Right, Does right, yeah, no, <laughs> no, absolutely. Like, oh the, 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 the scene in the rain in yes. Hitch is my life. That happened? Yeah, like oh, I I'm use so that sorry. for real, you know, but here's the deal. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm over that. And where's she now? You know, it's, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, that's so much more heartbreaking. No, you know, it's real. But, it, but it's like we all have those things that happen to us that are a good, solid 70% of why we do all of the stuff that we do. Something happened in an early part of our lives that shapes us, you know, really dramatically. So you know, for me, when I find that thing in those characters in pursuit of happiness, um, Chris Gardner said something to, to me that became the basis and it became the opening of the movie. He said he didn't meet his father until he was 28 years old. And he said he always told himself that his kids were going to know who their father was. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Whole movie. You know what I mean? It's like the pain of not meeting his father shaped his entire life. Mm. You know, and fi you know, finding finding those things have been really helpful. And then you get into the intricacies and the nuances beyond that. But that, that's a really good solid baseline. I am so sorry because I think we're out of time and oh, no. I have so many questions. Will you come back and we'll show the whole movie and we'll do this again sometime? Yeah, they should probably see the movie. Yeah. That would we're, be gonna, <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna try um, again, so please stay put to show the rest of the movie. But uh, what? We they have the ending. They have the end, yes! yes. Well, Thank kind of God. Yeah. I spoiled it already, though. Already. So please. Then it dies in the end. <laughs> I genuinely cannot thank you. I do, I do this a lot, and this has been like one of the best experiences oh, of my thank life. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so thank much you. for being here. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Right. Thank you. you guys enjoy it.